Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining today's sessions. Um, uh, we are very happy that you give us your time uh, with us today, and we are very excited to welcome you here today. Now, I would like to give the floor to Professor Diana Suadement uh, to give us the opening and the introductions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pan Apu. Uh, so go, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this event. Uh, my name is Diana Suadiman. I'm a member of uh, New Wave Network and currently director at the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asians and the Caribbean Studies based in Leiden, the Netherlands. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to New Wave Distinguished Lecture by Professor James Scott which will be followed by presentations and roundtable on Myanmar hydropolitics. Uh, the, the event is organized by New Wave in collaboration with the Amsterdam Sustainability Institute, Water Security and Justice Cluster, and Mutual Aid Myanmar. So for those who are new to New Wave, uh, New Wave is an innovative training network funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 Research and innovations and Maris Klodowska Curie program. As a network, New Wave uh, includes 35 leading organizations in the field of water governance, including universities, research centers, international organizations, NGOs, and the private sector worldwide. In concrete terms, uh, New Wave pu uh, pushes forward a common research agenda and is currently working with its 15 PhD researchers that are con conducting their respective research on various water governance case studies around the world. Uh, before I start with my introduction uh, for Professor James Scott, I would like to also introduce Stu Mota. Uh, Stu is a New Wave early stage uh, researchers. Uh, Stu will be chairing uh, the Q&A session and the session roundtable on the hydro, uh, Myanmar hydropolitics later on. He's currently a PhD candidate at Faculty of Science, Environmental and Policy Analysis at Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. Uh, prior to come to the Netherlands, uh, Stu has worked extensively in the Mekong region as network liaisons for the Waterland Ecosystem a Greater Mekong a Research Program. And also, I think uh, Pan Ipu, for those who do not know uh, her, Pan Ipu is the Oxford Water Network Coordinator at the University of Oxford and a global water policy consultant uh, for the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. Uh, so before, uh, without further ado, I think, uh, let me introduce Professor James Scott, known to many of us uh, by his remarkable and ground uh, groundbreaking research work. Uh, professor Scott is a sterling professor of political science and uh, professor of anthropology and is co-director of the agrarian studies program at Yale University. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has been a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton's University and the Wissenschaftskollege zu Berlin. In 2020, he was also awarded the Albert O. Hirschman Prize by the Social Science Research Council. Through his extensive and in-depth research in Southeast Asia, Professor Scott has developed groundbreaking concepts and radical theoretical perspectives on how we can look at power relations while using a different set of analytical lenses. Uh, his research focuses on better understanding of power relations, politics, and interscalar power dynamic, shaping and reshaping the different actors and institutions, uh, strategies in the context of natural resource governance, approach from political science and anthropological uh, perspectives. This emphasis I found uh, and approaches uh, provide not only a very refreshing look at political science and anthropology, but also creates a bridge for current and future uh, trans transdisciplinary research. Uh, Last but not least, Professor Scott's work has significantly contributed to positioning peasants as decision makers the powerless as the powerful, the fairy fairies as the central, and in so doing, not only theoretically contest the existing power relations and to a certain extent power asymmetry in the world we all are living in, but also inspires many of us 
to each in our own way, further ongo ongoing debates on and contribute to social justice. So moving from Zumia in upland Southeast Asia to the Salwin uh, to the Irrawaddy River in, uh, in Burma, his work shows how academic research can inspire a new generations of researchers, both in the North and the South, and contribute to the creation of grassroots interscalar alliances in natural resource governance and beyond. So before uh, I invite Professor Scott to start with the talk, I think Pan Ipu would, uh, would like to uh, share some information on the logistical procedures regarding the Q&A uh, section. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Diana uh, Suhadman, for, the, for introducing Professor James Goss and uh, me and Stu as well. Uh, before we start the sessions, I would like to share a bit of housekeeping. So this webinar will be recorded and also will be streaming via the New Wave YouTube channel. And the recording will be made available by the end of the sessions. Um, you will notice that all of your mics are muted and the cameras are turned off. Uh, this is intentional to keep our focus on our speakers and also our panels today. So at the bottom of the Zoom webinar on your computer at the toolbar, you will see the chat function as well as the Q&A functions. Please do use this Q&A function to ask your questions uh, for the speakers um, if you have any during and after the uh, presentations. Um, you can also type and submit the questions um, and also people can also upvote the questions uh, in which you like to ask uh, the speaker and then make them answer first. So yeah, and also please do send any other additional comments or greetings via the chat. So please do reach out or write in the chat if you experience any ongoing technical issues, but please bear in mind that our limited capacity to address this issue why the webinar is running. So now I would like to welcome and give the floor to Professor James Scott. The floor is your professor. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank you for the overly generous uh, introduction uh, to me and my work. I'm honored uh, to be before this particular uh, audience uh, and very conscious of the history of the Dutch in hydrology, whether it's the Fens or Bali or other places in the world. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm particularly happy to uh, present a uh, the rough version of what I hope will become uh, a book uh, uh, to this particular audience. Uh, let me say something perhaps about the nature of the book itself. Uh, I've been reasonably dissatisfied with most of the books on rivers that pay more attention to homo sapiens than they do to rivers um, and also seem to be preoccupied with uh, simply the H2O, the water, uh, and, uh, and the different claimants to this water, whether for irrigation or for turbines or for drinking water. Uh, I hope to have, if you like, a river-centered book uh, that pays close attention to all the life world of all of those non-homo sapiens, non-humans, on whom the river is their life world. Um, the structure of the book emphasizes uh, first, the idea of time and movement. Um, that is to say, uh, if you open the temporal lens wide enough, everything is moving. <clears throat> we of course are standing or sitting on tectonic plates that are sliding, moving up and down, even though it's completely imperceptible to us. But over time, um, uh, it is they, we are nonetheless moving. Um, the I want to show the first, if I could, the slide, which is a 407,000 year depiction of the uh, polar ice cap. Uh, and when it gets way down to 22,000 um, uh, before the current era, that is the last glacial maximum. Uh, and it is quite an astounding glacial maximum. So this gives you some sense, if you like, of the climatological changes that have happened over a long period uh, of time. 
I'll let you just watch the rest of this. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, it is also important to emphasize that things that we don't normally think of as moving are actually moving. To take, if you like, the uh, period after the last glacial maximum 22,000 years ago and moving from, let's say, uh, 15,000 BC until 7,000 BC, uh, we can see movement that is normally imperceptible to us. That is to say, if we take trees, which seem to be rooted in their place, uh, the fact is, if we had a time elapsed photograph of the warming after the glass glacial maximum, we would notice that the oak and beech trees that were in their refugia along the Mediterranean and in the Balkans were marching north and bringing with them uh, their insects, their birds, their soils, uh, and the suite of creatures that thrive in the forest, beech and uh, oak forest. So again, if you open the temporal lens wide enough, the things that we think of as static and unmoving are in fact uh, moving and moving over great distances, providing you open the temporal lens widely enough. The second, um, thing I want to emphasize uh, in the study I hope to finish um, is that the Anthropocene for rivers begins long before industrialization. That is to say, it is largely a Neolithic effect um, uh, brought about by agriculture and population growth and deforestation, not just deforestation for agriculture, but also for the firewood needed for pottery, for the firing of bricks for the walls of the early states, uh, for metallurgy uh, and warfare. Um, and if you add to that the drainage for agriculture, uh, the earlier dikes and levees to hem in uh, the river, the result is a tremendous transformation of the water uh, shed long before uh, the modern additions of dynamite, earth moving machinery and reinforced concrete that we are preoccupied with uh, now. Um, so the loss of wetland habitat, the floodplain clearance, the creation of large uh, sedimentation in rivers is in effect uh, a product of the Neolithic going forward uh, uh, until let's say 1600 um, at the latest. Um, the, the third aspect I wanna emphasize um, is the emphasis on non-human impacts. That is to say, um, all those life forms for whom the river <clears throat> Uh, and the riverine landscape is their life world. And not just the fish, which we often concentrate on because they're a particular of importance for human consumption, but bivalves, mollusks, flood adapted plants, waterfowl, other birds, amphibians, insects, uh, and biotic life um, generally, because that biotic life is the basis for um, the whole pyramid or the food chain uh, of the all the riverine species. Uh, to turn to the uh, my own interest in rivers, uh, I have done a lot of fishing and canoeing on rivers, as a matter of fact, historically. Um, and but I've been teaching a seminar on rivers and politics for the last seven or eight years. But I date the germ of my 
impulse to actually write something about rivers to an encounter that I had at a conference. Uh, and the conference site was hosting two meetings simultaneously. Uh, one meeting was for Southeast Asianists of which I was a part. And the other were uh, a, a hydrological engineers. And uh, since we were all housed in the same uh, site, we uh, took lunch and dinner together and we were instructed to mix with one another and carry on conversations across our uh, different specialties. I found myself sitting next to a very brilliant Philippine hydrologist. Um, and since I was instructed to uh, have a conversation across uh, these boundaries, um, I, uh, I had learned that the Colorado River, uh, this was 20 years ago, but I had just learned that the Colorado River never got to the Sea of Cortez for much of the year. And I, in a strange way, I was sad for the Colorado River because our assumptions of rivers running to the sea, uh, I felt sorry for the Colorado that it didn't get to run to the sea. And I was just trying to start a conversation with this hydrologist uh, and brought up this uh, fact about the Colorado River, Colorado River that um, uh, saddened me. He dropped his knife and fork and turned his chair toward me and said, no, no, no. It's the best thing in the world. It means that uh, all the water is used to the last drop for some human, from, for some important human purpose and not a drop goes to waste. I realized that this man and I were not going to have a long conversation uh, that we approached the world. Uh, I, he was approaching the world in a homo sapien centered utilitarian way. Uh, and I was being for his taste far too, uh, poetic. He, however, was not alone. Uh, this was the hegemonic view at the time. Winston Churchill, and uh, let me quote Winston Churchill on the Nile, um, quote, one day, every last drop of water which drains into the, whole, into the whole valley of the Nile shall be equally and amicably divided among the river people and the Nile itself shall perish gloriously and never reach the sea. Uh, Joseph Stalin shared this view with uh, Winston Churchill, although he was less lyrical and poetic about it. Uh, he simply said, water which is allowed to enter the sea is wasted. Uh, one could talk to anyone from the American Bureau of Reclamation or the Army Corps of Engineers and have exactly uh, the same uh, the same attitude. Um, I think the Bureau of Le Reclamation in the United States, their slogan for several decades was total control for greater wealth. Rivers, of course, on a long view are living things. They're born, they die, they move, they are frequently maimed or even murdered. Um, and the image you have on the screen here is an image of 4,000 years of the meander belt of the lower Mississippi River uh, prepared by James Fisk and published, I think in 1945. And it's an effort to depict all of the different channels, meanders and so on that the Mississippi River has traced. Uh, and it conveys not only as a beautiful image, but it conveys the history of movement and the extent of movement over a long period of time. The current Mississippi, if you trace it, is just the white band uh, that uh, threads its way through uh, this, uh, 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 these meanders. Uh, this was the result of scientific research or something like uh, six, 60,000 boreholes in order to excavate the um, uh, the silt and soil that would identify the different belts of the Mississippi. Uh, I mean, you could show the next one as well, I think, if you would. There we go. Um, uh, um, let's move to the next one. Um, so 
the river, a river that has been probably more um, migratory than any other river in the world. Uh, I'm not sure they uh, are in first place, but they're close to being in first place, is the Yellow River. Um, and uh, this shows from uh, 2278 BC until uh, 2000, uh, the changes in the path that the Yellow River takes uh, to the sea. Uh, sometimes it uh, uh, debouches north of the Shandong Peninsula and sometimes to the south of the Shandong Peninsula. And the second to last uh, shift, uh, which was to the south of the Shandong Peninsula, was actually a deliberate change in its path. Um, and this was engineered, if you like, uh, by Chiang Kai-shek in order to slow the Japanese invasion to the north. He destroyed the dikes on the southern facing portion of the Yellow River near uh, Zhengzhou um, and sent the river south in order to slow uh, the Japanese advance. It took the lives of something like 300,000 Chinese peasants um, in the process. Um, the result or the cause you could say of um, these changes are the fact that on the North China Plain, the gradient is extremely um, low. That is to say, the river slows down and the sediment that it carries from the loose soils uh, upstream raises the riverbed so that over time, the river becomes self damming. That is to say, it creates its own levee ahead of it as the sediment is deposited, and then it spreads laterally and seeks another path to the sea. As a new channel is clogged, the river may go back to an older channel that is now a faster route to the sea. So many of the courses of the river that you see were used more than once over time. Each flood raises the land flooded by the deposition of sediment. So the floodplain, for example, in the middle Nile is now 10 feet higher than it was 5,000 years ago. Um, and the result of this, of course, is that historically, a lot of river port towns and coastal towns at the river's mouth are vulnerable to being blocked by the buildup of silt and sand and clay and sediment. Bruges, uh, a, a particular uh, brilliant example, uh, was a great linen center. Uh, its river, the Zwin, silted up in the 15th century and merchants left for Antwerp, leaving an urban gem and museum piece that we can enjoy today. today. Brizac on the Upper Rhine was in Roman times on the left bank. The 10th century, it was on an island in the middle of the Upper Rhine. In the 13th century, it was on the left bank again. And since the 14th century, it's been on the right bank. This is true for lots of towns on the, along the Irrawaddy historically uh, that have had to move with the river in order to have a suitable port and sometimes across the river uh, as well. I had a view of the, uh, let's have the next picture by the way. Yeah, this is a, just from 1855 to uh, 1976, the many different traces that uh, the Yellow River took um, uh, north and south of the Shandong Peninsula. I had a view of the changes in the course of the river that are described in the technical literature as accretion, that is to say, the gradual carving out of meanders uh, as a river uh, at its flood pulse um, is likely to exaggerate a bend uh, because of the difference in the flow rates. Uh, and that little by little by little, um, large changes were made in the course of the river. Um, I realized, uh, realized I was mistaken um, in, the, uh, in this by having spent the, most of a decade in the summers along a trout stream 
in central Pennsylvania in the United States. Um, and uh, I had observed the changes in the, uh, in the stream over time that were a result of ice. Um, but in 1972, there was a massive flood. Uh, and I realized suddenly that 99% of the changes in the stream uh, occurred during flood tide, right? At the very peak of the flow uh, within a very small number of hours. Uh, and this is called avulsion, of course, in international law. Uh, and it is the sudden change in the bed uh, of a river that comes from catastrophic floods uh, or uh, large, uh, simply large floods. Um, the, uh, let's see, the, um, one can see this movement in oxbows. You're all familiar with this in which uh, oxbows are cut off and create um, actually very important wetlands uh, along the floodplain. Uh, the next one, please. This is just an actual photograph and you can see, uh, we go back one, yeah. Uh, one can see the um, uh, oxbow that has been cut off and on the left side, I think of your screen, you can see a meander that probably in the next flood or the next one after that, uh, might be cut off and create another uh, oxbow. Um, uh, next image. This is just a map of the uh, Aowati River uh, from uh, Bama and Michina in the north all the way down to Mulmain uh, and Laputa uh, in the uh, Irrawaddy Delta. The Irrawaddy is moving all the time, of course, as well. Um, in a trip downstream from Mandalay to the ancient capital of Bagan, on a small inboard motorboat carrying about 20 passengers, um, because of the change in the bed of the river, and this was the period, the dry season, when the river was relatively low, we had to use four pilots in order to navigate uh, the channel of the Irrawaddy. That is to say the captain of the ship who had been doing this trip for the last 20 years um, did not trust himself because on a daily basis, the um, channel would change depending on uh, how the sand moved uh, uh, and how uh, drifting of uh, sediment could clog a channel that had been viable only the day before. These four pilots were each a specialist in a particular stretch of the river and they made their living this way. They came on the boat um, uh, for two hours or so. Uh, they navigated us uh, through the channel which they knew intimately. And then when their knowledge was exhausted, they got off the boat uh, at a particular designated village and a second pilot got on who knew the next stretch of the river. And after that, a third pilot, and after that, uh, a fourth pilot. Um, and of course, uh, uh, it happened uh, reasonably often uh, that boats got stuck nonetheless, uh, although with less frequency, if you had a knowledgeable pilot. Um, on bigger cargo carriers on the Irrawaddy, the danger was greater. Which, the next image, please. Uh, American viewers uh, will uh, be struck by these poles, which are uh, used to gauge the depth of the river uh, at the prow uh, of all of the ships that navigate the Irrawaddy. And those markings are um, uh, markings of, of depth. And uh, two people at the front of the ship are likely to use this in low water and call out something like that would be translated four feet, four and a half feet, five feet, three and a half feet, uh, giving the draft that is available beneath the hull uh, of the ship. Next image. 
uh, when we got stuck, you can see how shallow now these this the ship has become stuck. It is a larger one than the one I was describing earlier with only 20 passengers. And what they did was to put off three crew members and what you see them doing, we can have the next picture as well. The next, here we go, but just a close, a close up. They are planting the stake in the sand. Uh, and once they, when they have it secured, it will be attached to a cable uh, and that to a winch on the back of the, on the stern of the ship. And the ship will then uh, uh, navigate, wiggle itself back and forth to the left and to the right and try to get itself off the sandbar on which it is, uh, of which it is stuck. And this happened on a longer trip uh, with a larger ship uh, four times. And in one case, uh, it lasted for more than 24 hours before we were able. Uh, and there are uh, quite occasionally ships that are stuck uh, in low water and they have to wait for the monsoon, uh, which raises the level of the uh, Irrawaddy enough so that they can back off and continue their trip. And they leave a skeleton crew on the ship so that it's not stripped of its pipes and copper and uh, motors. Um, so one more thing about um, the movement of rivers over time. Uh, it means that ideas that we are familiar with of a 50 year flood, a 100 year flood and so on are actually nonsense. Um, I urge you to turn off your audio when you hear a description of a 50-year flood or a 100-year flood. Um, the Rhine, for example, had four 100-year floods in 12 years, in 1983, 88, 93, and 94. That should give one some pause over the meaning of a 100-year flood. Now, it is true that a hundred year flood means that every year you have a one in a hundred chance of having such a flood. So statistically, uh, although it would be rare, uh, it is uh, not impossible. But for most rivers, we simply do not have the statistical series of water level and volume flows that go back more than a hundred or 200 years, which would even in principle allow us to make such a statistical generalization. Now, the Yellow River or the Yangtze or the Rhine or the Danube or the Euphrates would be partial exceptions in which we have longer records. But the most important thing is that even if we did have a deep historical series, the assumption behind such generalizations is of a hydrological equilibrium. But the river is not the same river from year to year. It's moving silt and sand and clay. It's carving new channels and meanders. Its normal flood stage is building natural levees. And if we add the early Anthropocene and the Neolithic, uh, it radically a river is not the same river um, when, from one year to the next as the watershed is deforested and the amount of silt in the river uh, increases. Um, if we take the Mississippi that we've uh, seen images of, in 1800, most of the Mississippi bank was forested. In 1960, 95% of the Mississippi River Bank was in agricultural crops. Even if we forget about all the other uh, interventions, um, the fact is that uh, the, the assumption of a 100 year flood is assumes that the river remains a constant hydrological in, in constant hydrological equilibrium, when in fact uh, the hydrological uh, equilibrium of river is changed radically, often from decade to decade. The most important movement uh, to get to the uh, core of my talk, the most important movement in the annual life of a river is the flood pulse. 
that part of the year during which the river overflows its channel banks and occupies its habitual floodplain. The pulse of high water may come from the monsoon, from snow or glacial melt, from seasonal rainfall, and it may be of different degrees of variability. But it is a completely natural part of the annual cycle of a river. The flooding of the river floodplain represents the lungs of a river. And I mean this in a quasi literal sense. The condition of the vitality of a river and of the creatures who depend on it are dependent completely on the flood pulse. Without the annual flooding of the floodplain, the channel which we usually associate with the river at rest in paintings and photos is comparatively dead, biotically speaking. So I would urge you not to think of rivers as a line on a map that stays where it's put or where it's designated on the map, but to understand that this is a constantly pulsing river spreading out every year, uh, sometimes twice over its floodplain. I understand that uh, flood is a scare word and it's very deeply anthropocentric. Uh, and if I had my way, I would ban its use. Uh, it is just the river breathing as it must. On this view, we would understand a flooding of settlements near the river on the floodplain as a result of Homo sapiens encroaching on the natural floodplain of the river, an act of trespass. The periodic flooding of the floodplain is the life world and condition of existence of all the species that inhabit the river or who dwell along the river. Uh, can I have the next image, please? Uh, this may be hard for you to, uh, to read, but it is a processual image of the effects of the flood as the river rises uh, and uh, drowns the vegetation at the edge of the river, and then uh, the uh, the forested floodplain, uh, and then uh, retreats uh, as uh, the flood recedes. Fish, for example, get as much as eighty percent of their total annual nutrition from the huge flood pulse that the flood stage affords as they spread out over the floodplain. That is to say, the floodplain contains the nutrition that is central for most of the life forms within the river. They spawn, they put on, rate, on weight, they feed on the invertebrates and the decaying organic matter and the microbes that are on the floodplain. There are huge migrations of fish to take advantage of this feeding frenzy. Uh, and anadromous fish, salmon, alewife, herring, shad, not to mention non-seagoing fish, rush for the food. The floodplain may be 40 times wider than the channel. In the Amazon, of course, there's a huge variation. And there are in the Amazon fruit eating fish uh, that depend on the flood pulse to raise the river level so that they can reach the low hanging fruit uh, along the banks. In the Mississippi, the fish catch had declined by 83% over 50 years, but the year after the 1993 massive flood, the fish catch established a new record uh, for fish capture. Studies of the Danube have shown that the greater the extent of a flood in a given year, the greater the fish haul the year after. It's not just fish, but a whole cavalcade of all those creatures that depend on the concentration of nutrition. That is to say, waterfowl, riverine wetland birds, heron, muskrats, fox, wolves, raptors, herbivores coming for the fresh grass, sprouting after the flood recedes, and all the microparasites that feed on this cavalcade. So as the flood recedes, much of the nutrition from the floodplain 
returns to the channel as the water uh, comes back into the channel, recedes into the channel, where some of the larger fish, channel catfish, dolphins, benefit as well, as well as the comparatively immobile shellfish clams and bottom larvae. The point is that the flood uh, not only benefits those creatures that are able to feed on the flood pane itself, but those creatures who are in the channel and don't leave the channel, but who benefit from the nutrition that the recession of the annual flood brings back into that uh, channel. Um, so that the flood as it recedes provides, um, along with the river's tributaries, most of the nutrients that are available. What the flood provides, if you like, is connectivity. It moves water over the landscape, creating a huge variety of habitats. Backwaters, ponds, marsh environments, slow moving, warmer water, refuges from larger predators, uh, varied assemblages of food and habitat that favor different rivering species. The whole mechanism depends on the microbial richness of the floodplain and that represents the bottom of the food pyramid for the entire life world of the river. Without the flood pulse then, the river is comparatively dead, biotically speaking. I mean to emphasize non-human species here, but, uh, and let me also add that um, in both Europe and North America, uh, the non-human uh, landscapers of uh, rivers historically have been beavers. Uh, and beavers are responsible, if you like, for slowing down the movement uh, of water by innumerable dams, creating wetlands and rich habitat, and the extermination of the beavers, essentially for uh, the hats of Europeans, um, was a, a devastating blow to the wetland richness of uh, a, if you like, a river system inhabited by millions and millions and millions of beavers who are now, uh, they're trying to restore them, uh, but they became largely extinct. Um, now, I've talked about non-human uh, species here, but let me say a bit about what the flood pulse does for Homo sapiens. Um, in a word, the floodplain produces civilization. No floodplain, no civilization. Almost without exception, all archaic civilization were found on floodplains, often near the estuary of a river. Why is that so? It's the only place where you can have a concentration of foodstuffs and people in a small circumference in which state making is possible. Look at what the flood does. It drowns all the competing vegetation. It lays down a layer of nutritious silt that provides nutrients to the crops, usually cereal grains. It provides, especially if it's a well-behaved flood in the Nile Valley generally, a perfectly harrowed field ready for sowing. No plowing is needed. Uh, often you can just broadcast the seeds uh, over um, the silt that uh, flood recession has created. Hence, the oldest form of agriculture was flood recession agriculture, still practiced um, uh, in Burma and in lots of other places, I might add. Um, flood retreat agriculture was uh, American Eastern woodland cultivation uh, along streams. Could you have the next image, please? This is a particular example uh, of the small floodplains along uh, woodland streams in North America that would have been sown uh, in small crops by Native Americans. The next one, please. This is a, uh, a large alluvial island created by the deposition of silt in the upper uh, Irrawaddy uh, below Bama, uh, and uh, villagers compete uh, vigorously 
for the rights to this land because it is so extraordinarily rich, even though it requires building a, a bamboo bridge every year uh, in order to uh, allow the cultivators to move from each of the banks uh, into uh, this alluvial island that is seasonal rich agricultural land. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to skip um, a, uh, we could see the next image, please. Okay, that, this is, um, uh, the portion I'm skipping over is what I would call for those Southeast Asianists among you, uh, a wetland zomias, that is to say, historically, uh, people who have tried to get away from the state have gone to the mountains and the hills. But in fact, another refuge are swamps and marshes. So that in, for example, in uh, the Great Dismal Swamp on the border between North Carolina and Virginia, uh, there were 6,000 escaped slaves at the beginning of the Civil War because it was a place to which uh, slaves could escape and be safe. This is a depiction of the uh, below Basra of the Marsh Arabs, uh, which was a place of refuge for uh, thousands of years actually um, in marshes, finally destroyed uh, by Saddam Hussein uh, and drainage, but it was a place where uh, rebels, people who didn't want to be conscripted, um, uh, enemies of the state and so on, uh, could repair to, and they became, if you like, an ethnic group there. Uh, the next image, this is a picture of the Marsh Arab uh, area. Next picture. This is a, a, an, a reed built palace of a sheikh among the Marsh Arabs. Its floor has to be replaced uh, every year by a new layer because it starts to rot, but it's quite an extraordinary piece of architecture made entirely uh, with sedges and reeds. Uh, the next image. This is what's left of uh, much of this area today. And the people who live there are now beggars in Basra and Baghdad and so on. Next image. Uh, this is the picture of the um, Great Dismal Swamp uh, area that I referred to that was a refuge for runaway slaves. Next one, please. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, also wrote actually a superior uh, novel called The Tale of the Great Dismal Swamp, Dread, uh, at, almost in uh, penance for what she thought were the mistakes of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Next one, please. That's uh, uh, the author. Next one. Uh, the uh, For those of you familiar with Chinese literature, uh, the Water Margin novel is a great classic of literature, and it's about uh, runaway uh, gentry, serfs, peasants, and so on in the Huai Valley uh, Delta, uh, south of the Yellow uh, River and north of the Yangtze. And it's a actually very famous classic. Uh, you can buy a deck of cards with 106 or 109 heroes of uh, this uh, epic. And it reads like a cowboy um, uh, epic that is actually hard to put down. Next picture, please. Okay, this is an example of uh, the Rhine uh, and the so-called rectification of the Rhine uh, that uh, you can see all the meanders that have been eliminated. Uh, those are the dark blue um, uh, tracings and the bright blue line uh, represents the uh, re-engineered Rhine in which all of, uh, for navigation purposes, uh, the loops that have been taken out uh, in order to 
increase the flow and make it more easily navigable. Uh, and it has shortened, I think, the total length of the Rhine by something like 143 uh, kilometers over time. Uh, now floods are um, understood by ecologists as an instance of disturbance ecology. That is to say, um, for environmental scientists, the word disturbance um, uh, carries a purely scientific meaning. However, uh, I don't particularly like the term disturbance because it risks obscuring the fact that floods are an annual natural and fairly predictable event in the river. That is to say, they're not disturbances at all. They are part of the rhythm of the river. That is to say, such disturbances are normal and periodic and to be expected. Um, and, uh, it, but the word disturbance is proposed in contradistinction to equilibrium analysis in which the succession and distribution of fish and insects and birds reached a terminal state that was stable. And as we can see, the forceful stopping of these natural perturbations, that is the real disturbance, the real intervention, the, the attempt to enforce a permanent equilibrium uh, in the river and to stop its natural movement. Um, the flood creates new mosaics of plants and animals and insects. It opens the canopy. Um, uh, it begins a new succession of colonists, a mosaic of patches. You can see what the flood accomplishes. It eliminates much previous vegetation. It soaks the soil deeply, bringing in nutritious silt an open and inviting environment waiting to be colonized. It welcomes flood adapted marine life, flood adapted insect life, flood adapted flora, seeds that have been waiting a long, long time for a good soaking. It invites quick colonizing species from adjacent patches. It creates a favorable spawning environment for a selection of species of fish, insects, and birds who do best in uncrowded open environments. It creates innumerable edge environments or ecotones that as we know are species rich precisely because they provide access to two or more environments often seasonally. This is what happens without humans, uh, although humans have tried to shape this. Um, I, I want to, um, make a parallel here between fire and flood, uh, often which are considered to of the great plagues of mankind. Fire, which is also natural as are floods, kills much of the previous flora and opens the canopy. Just as there are water of flood adapted species, there are fire adapted species, pine trees, whose seeds only germinate by fire created temperatures. Then there are the so-called R plants that quickly colonize like in the United States fireweed. You have morel mushrooms. I know European mushroom hunters that if they're visiting the United States consult maps of forest fires in the previous year because they know uh, that if they go to a place that has been burned the previous year, the morel mushroom harvest is going to be uh, abundant. Um, again, uh, much of this happens without humans, but humans can use it. Uh, the example of Sweden uh, cultivation or uh, shifting cultivation, or so it's called sometimes slush and burn cultivation, uh, it essentially uses fire in the same way uh, that's a human adaptation to what fire can accomplish because fire was of course the earliest tool in the hands of homo sapiens. In Sweden cultivation you slash and dry the trees and brush uh, and open the canopy. 
uh, when the slash has dried, you fire it when the wind is perfect. The ash oxidizing the plant matter provides fertilizer. Uh, you can plant or broadcast uh, with a small dibble stick. Um, and you can repeat this every few years in a new plot. It's easy agriculture. Um, and in fact, after the Black Plague in Europe, people retreated from when the population was uh, uh, decreased radically and the amount of land available to people was increased, uh, they moved back to Sweden cultivation because it was less, less labor intensive for the calories that you could um, extract. Um, so what humans have been doing to rivers in the late Anthropocene in particular, it has been sculpting rivers for its own purpose. But it's only with the invention of dynamite in 1870, the subsequent earth development of earth moving machinery, bulldozers and such, and reinforced concrete that are, if you like, the essential component of dams that the sculpting of the river landscape has taken on protean proportions. Um, it's more like some combination of taxidermy and amputation. That is to say, uh, the intervention was often for a single functional purpose to turn a river into a, an orderly navigation channel, to turn a river into a series of lakes that would then either produce irrigation or uh, turbine generated uh, electricity. Um, the, uh, the Rhine is the first striking example with Johann Gottfried Tula around 1800, the rectification of the Rhine was the name of the treaty uh, that was uh, negotiated. It eliminated meanders as we've seen. It removed barriers in the channel. It confined the river to a single bed with no braids of uniform width and uniform depth and hopefully uniform speed of current and to make it into a canal. That is to say, the effort was to take a river and make a canal to domesticate the river for a single human purpose, to take a variable and make it a constant. Um, and it was, as I mentioned, shortened by 150, roughly 150 uh, kilometers. In the upper and I'm, I'm conscious that I'm speaking to the residents of the Lower Rhine uh, here. Um, drop of water in Switzerland that would have taken 10 days to get to Holland now takes only three days uh, to get to Holland. So you can have uh, an appreciation for how it has radically changed the structure uh, of the river over time. Um, so the abstract question I suppose uh, that is not answerable in any simple way is uh, when is a river still a river? That is to say, uh, given all the human interventions in a river, um, can you still call it, uh, call it a river? I remember uh, actually uh, at a university at which I taught, we had uh, a friend who had uh, a cat. And the first time we saw the cat, it, for some reason, its tail had been uh, amputated. The second time we saw the cat, it had been spayed or neutered so that it couldn't reproduce. Um, and the third time we saw the cat, it had had its claws removed surgically. Um, and I remember my wife and I talking on the way back from the visit with this, uh, uh, the owner of the cat. Uh, and asking, uh, could you still call this a cat? How many things can you take away from a cat and still call it a cat? Uh, well, I'm not sure what the answer is, but it seems to me uh, one has, in a sense, denuded a river of so many of the attributes of a river 
uh, that calling it a river is no longer uh, a useful description of uh, this uh, channel of water that has been so engineered uh, and domesticated. Um, again, the most striking example of this is the Yellow River. Um, because what happened along the Yellow River, especially when it slows down on the North China Plain, is the growth of population and the growth of levees in order to protect that population. The early Chinese dynasties wanted to protect that population because they uh, were uh, producing grain, valuable grain. They paid taxes. They were conscripted. Um, they were the basis of, if you like, state formation. Um, and so um, what they did was to confine the river by a series of dikes and levees. The result of that, uh, because the water slowed down uh, because of the gradient of the North China Plain, is that uh, the silt was deposited on the bed of the channel and therefore raised the level of the river. Um, the river then, the river bed rose well above the surrounding plain. And here you have an example uh, where the river is, the bed of the river is 33 feet above the surrounding plain near Kaifeng in Hainan. Thus, a 1998 flood, which contained only a third as much water as the 1958 flood, nonetheless rose three feet higher on the dike wall. Now, in Kaifeng, uh, what you have is an aqueduct. This is, you may want to call it a river, but in fact, it's 33 uh, feet above the surrounding floodplain. Um, and it is an aqueduct and not uh, a river that is, our sense of a river is something incised in the landscape uh, and below the uh, surrounding floodplain. Uh, I want uh, to, to wind up by at least referring to an argument um, that I want to make about rivers and that also brings together uh, the analysis of fire uh, with water uh, in rivers. There's a medical term called um, iatrogenic illnesses. And it's a simple way of describing uh, what we often say, the cure is worse than the disease. Uh, in this case, that is to say, iatrogenic illnesses, which are a majority of hospitalizations in the United States, I'm told, uh, are medical problems that arise because of previous medical treatment either the rise of antibiotic resistant um, uh, germs and viruses, uh, the uh, result of earlier surgical interventions, the clash of different medications that are operating at cross purposes and so on. Um, our understanding of flood and fire ought to be taken in this particular context in which what looked like the successful treatment of a modest pathology directly contributes to a massive pathology that's much harder or impossible to treat. And here, uh, the antibiotic analogy, I think, uh, is useful to think with. That is to say, the general use of antibiotics to treat a wide variety of relatively minor bacterial infections or to use um, in raising livestock just simply to, as a precaution to uh, avoid possible outbreaks of disease, encourages by selection pathogens that are increasingly resistant to existing antibiotics. That is to say, it's the very success at a smaller scale that creates over time a much larger bacterial threat. Um, the 
one can see this um, in lots of medical examples that I'm going to skip over. But let me return just briefly to finish up to disturbance ecology and related to iatrogenic conditions. My contention is fairly straightforward. The elimination of small disturbances directly creates the conditions for larger catastrophic disturbances. Preventing small floods leads to large floods. Preventing small forest fires leads to large forest fires. In the United States, for example, for a long time, uh, the US Forest Service thought its job was to suppress all fires, uh, even though the great majority of fires are completely natural phenomenon spread by lightning uh, and so on. Fire suppression is an artificially maintained equilibrium. That is to say, like the elimination of uh, small floods in the floodplain. Uh, but the effort was to prevent all forest fires and to extinguish them as quickly as possible. So fire suppression is an intervention of a human caused disturbance or elimination of what would be large numbers of naturally occurring minor fires. Fire suppression uh, was a decades long uh, policy of the Park Service. And the result was the huge buildup of combustible material in the forest and an artificial equilibrium that favored fire, uh, that favored fire intolerant trees that would not have been there in such numbers. Uh, so for example, lodgepole pines. Um, the result was uh, in 1988, huge fires uh, of proportions that no one had ever seen before that was a result of the suppression of all the small natural fires. In the same way, the suppression uh, of, uh, if you like, floods by dikes, and levees and so on uh, in the Mississippi River uh, and by the straightening of the channel uh, and the draining of adjacent wetlands and the extermination of the beaver um, uh, eliminated all those processes that created small disturbances, many of which were actually beneficial for agriculturalists and for Native Americans uh, historically. So the effort to prevent the floodplain uh, for any settlement and culture resulted in a kind of political uh, lock-in. You had agricultural crops right up to the river for about 90% of its length, a policy of levees only that walled in the river and the silt of course was deposited on the riverbed as in Kaifeng, raising its bed above uh, the adjacent uh, uh, plain. The result of this was that in the flood of 1993, uh, 1100 of the 1500 levees on the Mississippi failed and they had to break levees elsewhere to release the river, uh, the river into the floodplain and to choose which areas uh, would suffer. And as you can imagine, it was the most disadvantaged and marginal people uh, who suffered most. So 65 years of river engineering and billions of dollars spent on it since the great flood of 1927 was completely undone in a few hours. The river broke in the end its flimsy chains. Uh, 8 million acres were flooded, 12 to 14 billion in flood damages. It was a classic iatrogenic disaster, if you like, uh, that has resulted in hesitant efforts to restore something of the floodplain, but nothing like the efforts that are required to create a healthy river and a healthy, healthy ecosystem along the riverine channel uh, and within the waters of the river itself. Let me end there. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Scott, for this uh, very engaging lecture with so many interesting histories, sciences, and facts uh, from drawing from your personal experiences and years of um, uh, investment in research. Uh, from these lectures, uh, we have learned the roles of the flood and the river rhyme systems and also importance of the flood plains and how it interacts with the nature, the ecosystems, the non-human species and habitats, and also the current thinking of growth and development via the route of engineering. So uh, through this lecture, we saw and learned that the changes of river system uh, from the examples of the Yellow River uh, over the years uh, to the uh, local practices in the ARD River, especially um, uh, including the history and also changes uh, in development on the floodplains over the years. And I also think it's very great um, uh, to learn that uh, the river requires the necessities to breathe. Um, I think it's very intriguing fact. And then during the flood pause, and then with this concept of where the, uh, the river needs to be overflowing, occupies the habit habitual floodplains and the periodical flooding is amassed for the survival of the river and its relying ecosystems because of its living nature. So, and also you have give, given us a food for thought, especially the questions under one, one is the river, state of river. And I think it's very interesting question for our, all our audiences. Uh, when thinking over, especially this 21st century of the growth uh, development and also um, how to restore the rivers or the natures to its natural state. So with this, in mind, I would like to open uh, the floor uh, to the audiences. Please do write the questions in the Q&A. And I think I also would like to op open these questions to this uh, to our other panel panelists who are in this um, uh, webinars. So we have about six minutes and then yes, the floor is yours. I have not received uh, many uh, Q&A in the uh, Q&A box, but uh, when we are having another panelist sessions, you're also welcome to ask or post the questions in our Q&A chat. So we have received um, uh, Q&A now. Um, uh, Brian Bruns, um, uh, forgive me for the um, pronunciations ask, what do you think are interesting question to us about river restorations, such as uh, removing dams, having beavers, retent, rewinding, et cetera? I think this is uh, directed to Professor Scott. Um, and, oh, and in your opinion. Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, I see. Um, well, I think the, for a thoroughly industrialized um, Anthropocene rivers, um, what restoration has amounted to are the creation of small spaces that remind us what a river might have been uh, before. Uh, and they are uh, a kind of a little Disneyland miniature uh, if you like, of uh, uh, a wetland or a marsh or a floodplain. Uh, and so I think the, although the, the efforts are kind of honest and well intended, they have not gone very far uh, in um, bringing back, if you like, the hydrology uh, of the river. I'm not against, you know, small dams that are things that are called run of the river dams that don't change uh, its course, that don't sort of block the channel, um, that just simply use part of the flow. Uh, so the, the, if you like, small uh, interventions that minimize um, the natural flooding and try to, if you like, direct it in certain uh, uh, directions and so on. Uh, I'm completely, I'm completely in favor of what. What I want to actually emphasize, and I didn't I didn't get to this because I'm in the middle of of uh, putting together 
a section on the dry zone of Burma mm -hmm. and Pagan. Um, and so it turns out that the, the peopling of the dry zone, which is the core original uh, heartland, if you like, of Burmese agriculture and its drainage created what you might call the great drying. Uh, the dry zone is in the rain shadow of the Buguyoma, but it is also um, a, uh, so it's naturally dry and has less rainfall, although it has perennial uh, streams. The result of this was in fact um, a further drying uh, and the elimination of the, the groundwater level uh, to a much, much lower level. And Pagan and all of those structures I now understand were built with bricks that were not air dried, but fire kiln dried. So you can imagine and so here we're talking not about the modern era, we're talking about the 10th century, right? Um, uh, AD, um, that in a sense, the amount of firewood that must have been uh, required for all the monumental building uh, in the dry zone uh, of the early Kanban uh, or the Aung Paya uh, period, uh, this seems to me to be absolutely crucial for the present ecology of the dry zone. And, and one imagines that the uh, flora composition in the dry zone is radically different from what it would have been in the early 10th century before uh, the construction of Pagan and uh, all of these edifices. Thank you very much for answering this question from drawing the examples of Bagan. Um, and I think it's uh, very comprehensive as well. And then another question came up from uh, Frank van der Vogt. Um, he asked, what would you advise villages along the Iawadi River, how to handle the constant threat of being eroded away by the next flood? Uh, well, I would, I, I would, question the question. Uh, that is to say, um, I think that um, the fact is that, especially in the lower Delta, but also in other parts of the Irrawaddy, the agricultural de agriculture depends on the deposition of silt. Um, and so in a sense, uh, it is, although it dangerous at certain times, of course. Uh, the fact it is, it is the life-giving force of the river that has created the agricultural heartland of, I mean, the, the Irrawaddy River is, if you like, the highway of traditional Bama culture. Uh, and so you have an effect, um, you go up and down the river, at least to Bama, uh, to La Puta or, or Bogolé. Um, and you have recognizably the same language, the same culture, the same forms of worship, uh, the same uh, variants of Theravada uh, Buddhism uh, exchange. Um, uh, but if you go 30 miles into the hills uh, on either side of the Irrawaddy, you're in a minority area with a different language, different culture and so on. So in a sense, the, the Irrawaddy is what is the cohesive cultural, if you like, um, network it provided because it's so navigable. Uh, so I think that living with the Irrawaddy is what created Burman culture and uh, erosion is less a problem than the uh, provision of silt that is responsible for this flood retreat agriculture that was the, and then in, again, in the Delta, you have uh, periodic alluvial islands and people actually, if you like, I'm using the title of another book about another river, sort of dance with the river. That is to say, land is appearing and disappearing for every land that 
pieces of land that are eroded away, another alluvial island is created that's an opportunity for people to colonize and to plant crops in uh, for a year. And, and they often, they try to reinforce these alluvial islands so that in the next flood, the silt is added to so that the alluvial island expands rather than retreats. So the erosion is, um, uh, is giving and taking. Uh, at exactly the same time. And uh, I don't think it is a um, unmitigated disaster. And may, perhaps the questioner did not mean to imply that anyway. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for answering these questions um, and also um, uh, giving example from the AOD Delta and also the relationship uh, or the cohesiveness of this cultural diversity along the AOD. In Myanmar, we all, always call the AOD River as the rice port of the country and that it stay, is stay true uh, until uh, now. And then in the main river stem, there's not, not a lot of dams or like the, the area where they can trap the sediment as of yet. So I think like, uh, uh, there is also free free flowing river, at least like from the main stem to the delta flowing. Right. So, so if you, I mean, and actually, I, I might add to that 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 we, I, I became extremely conscious of the fact that um, it makes no sense to talk about the Irrawaddy uh, as the, if you like, the main stem, right? That is to say. Um, so much of the water and silt uh, uh, in the Irrawaddy is provided by the Chindwin, the Mu, right? The Mi'ng, uh, and, uh, uh, and so it seems to me that one has to think of the entire watershed, right? Mm -hmm. um, as, a single, as a single unit. Uh, and of course, uh, it's in those tributaries where most of the dams have been uh, created. Uh, above the Mietzon. Thank you very much for um, adding this information as well. I am quite conscious of time uh, because we have invited amazing panelists uh, who are working in uh, different river systems in Myanmar and then we have a lot to talk about. So thank you very much, professors. Uh, with that in mind, I think I would like to uh, have um, a short water break while inviting um, uh, Stu Molta to who will be introducing uh, the next panelists uh, to our audience. So Stu, whenever you are ready, the floor is yours. Great, thank you for that. And thank you, Professor Scott, for an excellent and, and quite inspiring talk. Uh, it, I think it set us up nicely um, to, to welcome in the, the panel. Um, and first up, I want to actually invite uh, Nongwon Lee to uh, begin and share her, her presentation. And while she's getting that ready, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an introduction and background. Very honored to have uh, Nongwon Lee with us. Uh, she is uh, Shan from Southern Shan State in Myanmar. Um, she has three different uh, master's degrees ranging from international development, sustainable natural resources, um, and global politics. Um, she, uh, she worked for years at the Earth Rights International's Mekong School based in Chiang Mai, uh, Thailand, and, and also served as a school training coordinator and alumni program coordinator. She is the founder and director of Monpon Youth Association, Mainam Kong Institute, which is based in Shan State, Myanmar, and also the co-founder of Weaving Bonds Across Borders based in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Um, therefore, for, for a new wave event, um, uh, which is a kind of early stage researcher training program. We really couldn't have a better person to kick us off. Um, Ang Wen Lee is, is not only researcher herself, but has uh, uh, trained and, and helped uh, pass on much of this knowledge to, to countless other people uh, working on this in the region. So with, with that, I'll, I'll hand it over. Thank you, Stu. Uh, for a brief introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be here as one of the panelists uh, on Myanmar politics, hydropolitics. 
Today, my presentation is about co-creating knowledge to enhance women's leadership for inclusive river governance in Inilic. Um, it is more about uh, um, the important roles of co-creating and co-producing knowledge. Why co-creating and co-production? Because it enhances local people participation in the research process. And the next thing is um, local community, it's center of the project. And through this uh, method, using, uh, applying this method, the um, stakeholder involved in this uh, research project will increase knowledge through collaboration among the, when we talk about insider, it is the local community and outside resources is the local researcher, and some other acad uh, academia. And the next thing is uh, local people also learn their own problems and find a better solution through the research processes. And this, this is the approach that we use uh, throughout this, uh, this uh, research project. The first thing is we start with consultation meeting with women activists. Later on, we also call as local researchers. So for this consultation meeting, um, uh, this, uh, this activity is lead, lead by uh, lead researcher. And the next step is the workshop. We are uh, also conducting a several workshop with local, active, local women activists. So this one also leads by the lead researcher. And the next step, and because we have uh, many steps uh, uh, for, uh, for this approach, um, that the next step is about a focus group discussion with local community. For this, uh, for this activity, the women activists, um, local researcher who already joined uh, the consultation meeting and workshop. So they organize this one and they lead this kind of uh, focus group discussion. And the next step is workshop with local women and community members. It is another step. This one also led by a local researcher. And uh, we also have a uh, regular team meetings. Um, for this activity, the stakeholder, uh, the involved stakeholder are uh, lead researcher, local researcher and local community member. And the next step is fee work. Fee work uh, for key informants in the view with the local community in our focus area. So for this activity, this uh, lead by 10 local community members who join a consultation meeting, workshop and different, uh, uh, a different type of workshop and the activity that we organize. So this one is the consultation meeting. Um, and the purpose of this consultation meeting is to understand the project idea, to define the concept of knowledge creation and co-productions. And also uh, this consultation also um, um, help us to build trust between lead researcher and the woman activist who is going, uh, who later on uh, become um, a local researcher for this project. And uh, through this consultation meeting, um, um, we, we will also uh, understand the general context of uh, gender and water politics in, in Lake Lake. And uh, lastly, um, the purpose of this consultation meeting is to conduct baseline survey. So this one is the, the, the second step of our approach. So after consultation meeting, then we conduct workshop with women activists. Women Organize, facilitate.
I think the internet uh, uh, is not quite stable at the moment. Yeah, thank you for that. I uh, seem to I lost the connection. Isn't yeah, it? are you are you back? Yeah, I'm back with another devices. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't oh, know no. where not I am right now. Okay, yeah. Okay, yes, I will continue uh, the purpose of workshop. Thank I you. I think I already Yeah. Um Stu, can you help me with the presentation? Because now I use my phone device. If you have, only if you have. If not, it's okay. Uh, yeah. Why don't you? Why don't you just speak? Okay, I will just speak then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay yes. Yeah. Yeah. The the purpose of the workshop with women activists is, um, it is the next step, the second step, that the local the local researcher, the um, the local researcher, they come together to prepare, to organize, to facilitate a meeting with the local community for focus group discussion in Inlay. And they also develop the agenda and resource questions to facilitate the focus group discussion in Inlay. So it is the second step. So. The next step is uh, we also have a focus group discussion. So for this focus group discussion, the um, local researcher they, uh, from the who joined the consultation meeting and also workshop several times. So now they became the lead, uh, the lead uh, facilitator organizer for this focus group discussion. Then the purpose of this focus group discussion is um, to learn about the significance of the inlay lake and its value, and also the general livelihoods of people in inlay. And another key thing is about the different the different roles of gender and water governance in inlay. When we talk about gov uh, water governance, it also includes uh, water availability, accessibility, utility, and control. Who has control over the water resource? And uh, the, uh, during this uh, focus group discussion, we also learned about the environmental issue in Inlay Lake, the problem, root cause, and possible solution as well. And the um, Another thing is we also learn women roles in water governance and women and development. Uh, throughout this uh, focus group discussion, the local researcher, they learn from the local community. The local community also learns from the local researcher. So it is the purpose of focus group discussion meeting. And and we also conduct several workshops with women activists, the local researcher and local participants from Inlay. And the purpose of this one is um, like uh, the, leads, the lead researcher, she or he never um, came, with, uh, came with a set of interview question or in, in, uh, interview question. But here what we are doing is the local researcher, they guide the, the local people to develop interview questions. They work together. And after that, from the interview questions, they review it and they test it. So in this way, they learn from each other. And we also have regular uh, regular team meeting uh, between uh, among the lead researcher, local researcher, as yeah. well as the local community. And um, yeah, the purpose of this, uh, this regular, com um, regular team meeting is to have a sense of ownership for those who uh, who involved in this process, in this uh, research project. And we also share the finding to each other as well as the challenges and lesson learned uh, from, uh, from this project. Then the next step is a, a field research. For the field research, uh, we um, the the local community 
now they became the leads, the, uh, the leader of this uh, fever. So no local researcher, no lead researcher are being part of this key inform informants interview. So they conduct the key informant interview by themselves because we are we we were working together already to set up the interview questions. So by this way, they already have a set of interview questions. Then they go to the field and they discuss with the local community. Then uh, fee resource also uh, help us verify the findings because we have a lot of findings through um, different stakeholders from different activity, from consultation meeting, after that uh, focus group discussion, and after that key informants interview. So we have several uh, findings, so it is um, a way to verify our findings. And to document and amplify the voices of the people as well. The strategy we use uh, for this uh, um, for this uh, for this uh, project is this project is led by the local women. So we can we can clearly see that they they have capacity to conduct the field work by themselves through working together closely. And uh, the good thing about this strategy is that uh, the power sharing and the decentralization because the local people, the local community are actively participated and engaged uh, uh, through, uh, throughout the process. And the diverse knowledge are being also shared among the, uh, the lead researcher, local researcher, and as well as to the community member who involved in this project. And that the good thing about this project is we, um, it is not a fake agenda. We, we keep everything open and and uh, we have also we also have flexible uh, project design because normally for the con um, conventional uh, research project the researcher prepare everything and go to the field and take information from the community and they don't even have time to share back to the uh, to the local people but here is totally different the uh, the local researcher uh, the uh, the the academic at uh, the academia they also working together to design the project to implement and to work together so uh, that is why the broad as uh, the research project is not a fit not come with a, a set of uh, uh, design so that's why we we make it flexible uh, to uh, to our community member what they want to do so every step as I, as I presented earlier, consultation, workshop, focus group discussion, key informant interview, this all are coming from the working together, not, uh, not from the individual person, like a lead researcher. So there's, there's uh, working through this way, so there's uh, more rooms for local people to uh, engage and to decide. And it is the last, uh, the last, uh, um, slide of my presentation. So so far, what uh, throughout eight years of the pro uh, eight months of this project, the inputs, uh, what inputs we have is more than ten stories and articles written by the local people. Um, from their uh, their findings, they 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 wrote some story and article based on what they are interested. So. This uh, story are also very free because um, we allow them to write everything that they want to do to 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 come up with. So for now, we have more than ten story and article. We also have draft film about women and water governance in India. So it is not an end of our project yet. It is eight months of the project. So we. We have a lot of uh, local people who already improve and who knows how to uh, design the project and um, actively engage throughout this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, some really important lessons there. You can really hear uh, 
how much attention has been given to designing uh, research that is non-extractive. I think there's some important lessons there for, for anyone doing research at this point. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, sorry, I was a little slow keeping up with your slides, but I, I think your point was, was, was made. Um, I would now like to invite our second speaker. Uh, Sajam Bright is a scholar activist and member of the Kryn people from Burma, where he serves as the head of water governance program with the Kryn Environmental and Social Action Network, or KSON. His research and policy advocacy work focuses on fostering inclusive, informed, accountable, and equitable community-based natural resource governance in the conflict areas of Kryn State, Burma. It is a great honor to turn the mic over to Sajam Bright. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you see me, Stu? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, hello everyone, it's my pleasure. My name is John um, from Kisan. Today, I'd like to talk about the Southern Peace Park in Myanmar's political shifting um, political context. And I would try to use this 10 minutes uh, you know, presentation to briefly answer some key questions that I think would be uh, most interested, um, uh, like uh, why the topic is important, and what is the Salween Peace Park? And what can we learn from it? And how it is relevant in this uh, current political context? Uh, so why relevant? Um, I would say now we have more unity after the coup. People from city have come to understand the life, oppression, and the struggle of ethnic nationalities in conflict areas. And now we have national unity government and the national unity consultative, consultative council, very important for the unity among different political actors in Burma. Of course, uh, there are still many challenges and gaps still to, uh, to fill. So now, and also we have federal democracy charter developed towards a new uh, federal uh, constitution. This is key for resource federalism that we are focusing. Uh, grassroots communities are working on community-based natural resource governance to the next level, strengthening local institutions like uh, my colleague just uh, presented, uh, community management of rivers, you know, forests and, and lands in autonomous areas. And uh, the official establishment of the Southern Peace Park in 2018 uh, with international recognition as awarded uh, 2020 Equator Prize by UNDP is a very good example of why we need to pay attention to the grassroots uh, movement like the Southern Peace Park in this changing context. Um, so what is the Southern Peace Park? What can, what can we learn from it? So the Southern Peace Park is roughly a uh, five and a half thousand square kilometer area on Thai Burma border in the homeland of the Karen people. Uh, at the center is the mighty river, one of the last remaining uh, free flowing rivers in, in Asia. So we need to talk about the importance of the Salween River. So uh, the Salween is historical and political river in a sense that many key defining political moments in Burma are connected to the Salween. It was the center of political movement since after uh, 1919 uh, uprising and still now and again happening. Uh, the Salween is culture and spiritual river for local indigenous community. Um, the Salween plays a key role in the formation of our ethnic identity and provide meaning uh, through our indigenous belief system. And the Salween is a source of livelihood for millions of people along the basin. Uh, and like uh, Professor also mentioned the characteristic of the river previously. Uh, but the previous and current military regime has started the plans for mega hydropower dams in the Salween 
posing many threats to our livelihood, culture, uh, and the environment. Uh, but in response to this, the Karen uh, started the Southern Peace Park a decade ago in an autonomous areas under the control of the Karen National Union. So I, I like to talk about uh, more about the Southern Peace Park. Um, the Southern Peace Park was founded uh, as a realization of self-determination, ecological integrity, and cultural survival. As you can see in this picture, the park is a prime example of grassroots democracy. It is democratically governed by local community uh, through an elected governing committee. Now you are seeing the Southern Peace Park governance structure, which is uh, explaining uh, the characteristic of how uh, grassroots democracy is happening in the Southern Peace Park. Uh, the park's resource uh, are, are managed by means of uh, uh, community-based uh, resource governance. And local people govern the forests, uh, uh, rivers, lakes, and mountains around them. And the, the, the park consists of a mix of different land use, as you can see in the, in the mapping here. It's a bit complicated, but uh, we don't want to go into that much detail. So the idea here is uh, to, to show the mix of different land use. And it consists of villages, traditional farm, uh, land, community forests, and wildlife conservation areas. And it hosts uh, 70,000 uh, uh, local community. And the part concepts and, uh, and functioning are rooted in our current uh, indigenous ontologies in our own perception of reality in our own indigenous knowledge and practices linked uh, to it. Uh, this include example of our spirits and ancestors, uh, as well as human and, and animals, all of whom are deeply interconnected. And our ontologies underpin our whole society, informing the shape of our livelihood, institutions, and customary law. Um, in this Olympics Park, we have three pillars, uh, peace and self-determination, environmental integrity and culture survival. So peace and self-determination. Uh, uh, the Southern Peace Park governance mechanism makes our local institutions strong and contribute to peace and justice, uh, enable us uh, to govern ourselves. When we talk about uh, self-determination, we do also in a decolonized sense. We have our own understanding of this term developed through deliberate democracy and cooperation with other ethnic and indigenous uh, people in Burma. And for us, determination, self-determination does not mean sensation, but rather respect. Respect for current traditions, belief systems, uh, the right to govern our own territories, the right to make and enforce uh, our own laws uh, in ways that fit our people and, and ways of life. So this underline the importance uh, to respecting the current communities and equal partners in the building of a future federal Burma. Um, environmental integrity. So our indigenous uh, uh, territory contributes to protecting one of the largest uh, contagious tropical forest area in the world and con contributes to combating climate change. And this is now by widely recognized. Uh, what indigenous custodian have in common uh, across continent uh, is spiritual links to the nature we care for. It is linked to spirits, ancestors, and future generations. Uh, this interlink is a big part of why indigenous people as well uh, uh, have taken such a good care of the nature uh, for centuries. Mm. So in Karen tradition, areas of particular uh, culture or spiritual importance frequently correspond with the uh, areas of uh, uh, biological significance, uh, like mountain ridges and water sources. And this has led us, uh, uh, led to a series of community managed protected areas being established across the Southern Peace Park as you, you have seen in, in the map before. So this underlines the importance of local indigenous conserved areas like the Southern Peace Park to help, uh, to help a future federal democratic uh, uh, Burma meet its goal on biodiversity and climate change. And, and last but not least, uh, our culture survival. So our way of life, belief systems, and our identity are all deeply connected to the nature we live with. 
for indigenous Korean relationship with nature is reciprocal. Uh, if we take care of the natural environment, then it will take care, take care of us in return. Uh, uh, for example, water ceremonies play a key role in, in annual harvest and plantation season, seasons, and, and community regularly meet on the bank of uh, our lakes and waterways to hold ceremonies and, and, and celebrations. It is not uncommon for communities to work together to sustain sustainably govern ponds and waterways. And this include the creation of fish uh, breeding zones and institution of local rules and regulations uh, on, on hunting, fishing and plant, planting and so on. So this underlines that in a future federal bummer, it is important, it is especially important for peace development and the environment that the indigenous peoples are allowed to govern their own lands according to their own uh, uh, knowledge system and the worldviews. Um, so uh, my fin uh, the final question as a takeaway, you know, how relevant? So the Southern Peace Park conceptualized the meaning of development uh, in, in federal Burma. We need to focus, uh, uh, we need to focus on bottom up and locally owned uh, approaches rooted in indigenous and local knowledge and practices uh, are the way to, to uh, the way to help, uh, the best way to help Burma. As uh, Professor James Scott uh, so eloquently described in his uh, book, The Art of Being, Not, not Being Governed. Uh, uh, thank you for this. Uh, in a similar way, the Saloon Peace Park governance system shows that uh, grassroots democracy is crucially important for effective local governance and strengthening of, of community institutions driven by local pathways should be at the heart of current institutional preparation for a future, I think, a federal Burma, democratic federal Burma. And the Southern Peace Park also showed how nature conservation can be done differently. It showed that the conservation uh, that fully includes indigenous science and a perception of nature as the link between human, animals, and more than humans produce better results for wildlife and humans alike. And um, the Southern Peace Park is a realization of an original form of land and natural resource governance that was uh, achieved through a community effort. Uh, this shows the potential and importance of grassroots initiatives uh, in, in shaping the state transformation process itself. As we are progressing toward a federal Burma, now is the time to ensure grassroots level ideas, proposals, and initiatives uh, are included. So uh, I would like to conclude finally that uh, the Southern Peace Park indicates how including the realities and worldviews of indigenous and local communities across Burma can help build a peaceful, sustainable future. So in the Southern, uh, whether we talk about the Shan indigenous belief or currently or Mon, a free flowing river is of uh, a central importance. You know, mega hydro dams uh, are out of the question for all. These dams are strike at the heart of our culture survival as well as people's ability to self-sufficient, maintain their indigenous knowledge and practices and govern our own territories uh, uh, by ourselves in peace. Their cultural practices are also oriented towards maintaining balance and harmony, uh, uh, focus on binding people together uh, with other people, you know, community with other community and, and people with nature uh, the binding of a future federal uh, uh, Burma should fully include and respect indigenous uh, worldview, which can promote cooperation between communities and create a broader sense of solidarity and responsibility. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that uh, powerful presentation. Uh, I think it really built on some of the grassroots democracy ideas uh, presented before you um, and on the process of federaliza federalization in Myanmar. Um, and, and, and beyond our talk here today or beyond a Myanmar focus, I really think the Sawin Peace Park is a, an important model for alternative ways of, of thinking about conservation. So thank you so much for that. Um, I will invite the uh, next panelist. Um, I want to introduce Dr. Kyung Mi Kim, who is a researcher at CIPRI's Climate Change and Risk Program, where she focuses on climate change and conflict and environmental peace building. In 2021, she received her PhD in peace and conflict research from Uppsala University 
and she'll be presenting on local politics of water community resistance against dams. Kyungmi, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Stu, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, very interesting panel. And uh, yeah, thanks, Professor Scott, for your intriguing lecture. That uh, was highly uh, interesting for us who've been working on uh, rivers, um, but with the much less, uh, much shorter time frame than 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 you were uh, you were referring to in your lecture. That's I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, read the book. And thanks for other panelists share to share your highly important uh, work related to communities in Myanmar. So yeah, I've done my PhD on, on, the, on community responses to, to, to dams in Myanmar. Uh, so I have, a, so this presentation summarizes some of the findings uh, from, my, from my work. So I would like to uh, start by asking uh, this question. So why, why do some communities uh, collectively resist uh, dams, uh, while others do do not. And uh, if you if you think about some of the most iconic uh, dam projects like the Mitsun Dam, the Hachi Dam, and also the the smaller dams like the Shueli Dams, the community's responses have been um, quite different. So just want to uh, present this map that Myanmar actually hosts uh, many many hydro uh, hydropower. Uh, sites uh, that are very in, in sizes. So many of them are still at the planning stage. Uh, during the democratic opening, the government was very much uh, pursuing to, to make progress on this uh, hydropower projects. And many of them are um, on, on, the, on, on some of the important rivers like the Irrawaddy and the Salin River, but also others are located in the different tributaries and the smaller uh, rivers uh, in Myanmar. And, uh, you, and, and Myanmar as a country, we know that the, the country has very strong tradition of activism and social movements, uh, even under very brutal military dictatorship. I think that, that having said that, some of the dams has uh, led to, I mean, dam project ideas has led to a very, uh, substantial nation nationwide uprising, such as the Mison Dam has led to a very, very significant social movement against the dam project. The Haji Dam has been opposed by the local communities as well as the uh, um, uh, very successful advocacy campaigns uh, for, for, for decades. But other small dams or even big dams, we don't really hear much about from the local communities and, the, and, and so on. So, uh, so I focused on this uh, question as to why, why there is such difference. And the, so I found, I found some of the answers like the, like the nature of the dams didn't really have much role to play in, in, the, in the cases of, uh, cases of Myanmar dams and, and the communities. Uh, so uh, at the, I mean, and, and also my explanation is linked to, to the title of my presentation because the water is also very much a local issue and the river and the people's relationship with the state, it's also very much um, embedded in this localized context. And because Myanmar is a conflict affected society, it's, it has uh, gone through a very, very a long, long history of civil war, the people, have different ideas about the state and that their identity has been formed uh, and shaped by this, uh, by, by their collective experience of the conflict during the last uh, century. So, I mean, that's, that's in a way um, the reason rather than, for example, this uh, like different nature of dams, like for instance, if, the, if a hydropower project gives enough local benefits to the population or not, or, does this uh, dam is located in a significantly uh, culturally significant site, for instance? Um, so, I, so, so I found that at the local level, these uh, factors actually play uh, play less of an important role. Uh, like, for instance, this uh, the local population's dependency on the land 
had a very little offer very little explanation why some local communities could uh, resist while others had to uh, remain silent. So, as you could, uh, as we also heard from the uh, pre previous presenters. Uh, remark on the, the Salween Peace Park, I think this local community's relationship with the state state in Myanmar and as well as in other conflict affected societies, it's, it's quite different from how we uh, think about our, I mean, uh, like for instance, my relationship with the Swedish state where I've been living as a, as a, as a citizen for the last 12 years, uh, state is not really a service provider, it's not really an accountable partner, it's rather it's a, it's a it is somewhere in between this predatory body. It's a, it is a, it is a entity that does something that affects uh, your community and your population, but not necessarily in a in a in a beneficial way. State administration, state-led businesses, state-led hydropower dams are the face of the state for these local communities. And uh, what empowers these communities to resist is uh, really. Uh, so much in the in the this mobilization structure that's embedded in these communities, like the religious organizations, like the Kachin churches, they played a very important role for local communities to organize uh, collective resistance during during the military uh, rule uh, prior to 2011 uh, opening. And also this dense and overlapping social networks. So so more of this. Uh, Dense and overlapping social networks exist in these, co these communities, they were more likely to uh, resist. So for, for instance, they share uh, kinship, they share ethnic ties, they share religious ties. Uh, so these type of uh, uh, factors that we sometimes call it social cohesion, I think it has a certain role in, um, in the success of these communities uh, to mobilize in the face of a collective threat. And also, again, this I think identity plays an important role that um, the identity has been shaped by the conflict in, in many parts of Myanmar, and especially the, uh, the strong victimhood shared among uh, the local population. It mobilizes people to take action because otherwise they'll be victimized again by the state and the military. So uh, yeah, other inhibiting factors uh, are like notably the state repression and the strong surveillance, I think these are the uh, definitely undermining the uh, local communities to uh, organize uh, resistance against them. So uh, this was a, a very short summary of the research and I'll be happy to uh, discuss more with the panelists. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumi Kim. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, your guys' chat on this, um, following this panel. I, I liked your comment of dams as the face of the state for these local communities. That's an interesting concept and something I imagine Professor Scott has some ideas about. Um, we're, we're almost there. We have our last uh, uh, presenter. Uh, and without further ado, I want to introduce Laura Keek. Laura, yep, great. Uh, Laura is a postdoctoral fellow at Tokyo College, the University of Tokyo. Since 2010, he has done ethnographic research uh, uh, among Kachin people in northern Burma. He has published on Kachin nationalist worldviews, the controversy around the Mietso and Megadam. I have learned a, a ton from him about that, and the anthropology of international nature conservation. Um, Hydropolics meets ethnopolix, the Mietso dam between Kachins, Bamas, and Chinese. Uh, turn it over to you, Laura. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so, as most of you know, the Misanda Mega Project uh, was a vast Chinese project. It, in the mid 2000s, it was the largest hydropower project by China ever abroad, anywhere. Um, and it imagined building seven large dams uh, on the upper stream uh, of the Airawati River in a kind of ethnic Kachin areas of northern Burma. Yet in 2011, the Burmese president uh, one-sidedly halted the construction of the Mison Dam. And this was a great international scandal, and it created a lasting tension in China-Burma relations. Now, 
Why did the president suspend the dam? This was in response to an unprecedented popular anti-dam campaign. Um, and this campaign was unprecedented, um, especially because it also brought together different ethnic groups. In a country of decades of civil war, ethno-nationally based civil war, uh, this campaign brought Kachin people, a minority people, and Pamas, the majority of the country, into a rare agreement. And this was especially striking because around that same time, 2010-11, the Kachin Bama kind of tensions were rising as war was resuming between the Burmese military and the Kachin independence organization after a ceasefire collapsed. So in this presentation, I would like to ask, how did such an inter-ethnic movement arise in this context? And I will draw from my ethnographic fieldwork in the Kachin region since 2010 and, and interviews and so on. So first of all, uh, we should say that there really was no one anti-dam movement, um, uh, an inter-ethnic movement as such. Actually, you could say there were three different movements. Uh, there was the local uh, Mison, this confluence Mison Dam area villagers especially led by churches, Catholic and Baptist churches, who immediately, when there was the first signals that some kind of a secretive big dam project is coming to our home area, started organizing and mobilizing and resisting. Only a few years later, by the mid 2000s, uh, did such a kind of awareness and an anti-dam resistance spread to broader Kachin society, to Michina town, to, to, to broader Kachin networks, church networks, activist NGOs and so on. And uh, uh, an awareness about this dam as a threat spread very quickly. Um, and uh, only uh, some years later, still, did this awareness and this anti-dam resistance spread to lowland Burma, Yangon, Mandalay, the big cities, Burma areas. Um, all these campaigns uh, were kind of shared a fear that their homeland would be taken over by a foreign power. So for Kachins, the fear was that the Burmese military state and the Chinese companies are taking over Kachin land. For Pamas, Burmese, the fear was so-called Chinese colonialism or a Chinese takeover of Burma. So the campaigns were often driven by nationalism, Kachin nationalism and Burmese nationalism. And, and the Misandam kind of campaign is interesting because it brought together these two different otherwise clashing nationalisms. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to just share with you five voices, five interview quotes from different campaigners from the Kachin and Bama and other sides, and to talk about this, how did this inter-ethnic kind of movement emerge? So this is the first quote, and this is by a Kachin activist. We felt upset. Our Kachin people are already suffering, forced to move, but other people besides Kachins don't get involved. All our work has no effect. We see more and more Chinese people coming and hundreds of trucks, backhoes, bulldozers, big new machines carrying supplies nonstop from China. We cannot sleep with the noise day and night. Woo, 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 woo. Kachin people are merely watching on the roadsides. We cannot do anything and nobody helps. So this is a sentiment that I encountered among uh, quite a few Kachin activists uh, talking about this time in the kind of mid to late 2000s, around 2009 and so on, when they feel they've spent a few years doing dangerous activism, often uh, trying to spread the information, protesting, sending protest letters, uh, organizing through churches and so on, yet nothing happens. The, the project steam rolls on, no one seems to pay attention, Lowland Burma doesn't seem to care. Um, so this general disconnect between the world of lowland Burma and, and the Kachin society. This is the second quote. And it's by a Bama activist uh, in Yangon. We were already very aware of the anti-Bama sentiment among different ethnic groups. So we always sought ways to connect, build trust and learn together to show them that the regime is not the same as the Bama people. So the first responders on the Mison issue were Kachins. They treated the issue as a Kachin issue, so they never collaborated with any outside actors. Their movement was cracked down on by the military. Some Kachin students were arrested, some ran away, and some came here to Yangon. We connected here. That's how we got involved. So this was a leading activist who really bridged a lot of different actors uh, from Kachin activists to Burmese government actors to artist networks, activist networks, 
And uh, uh, this activist and, and others uh, uh, emphasized to me that, look, for us, this was always also an inter-ethnic peace activism. This was also an attempt to create some sort of solidarity between Bamas and non-Bamas. Um, so they kind of consciously wanted to get involved and, 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 and uh, work together with Kitchens. This is the third quote, and by a Mison area uh, Kachin elder. The Bama protesters talked only about the Airavadi, maybe water pollution, how water will become shallow and ships cannot come up to Mandalay, not concerning us here, but concerning their side. That's why I doubt them. Maybe they love Airavadi, but not Mison. So this is a, a, just an example of a, of a broad sentiment among Kachin people that at the end of the day, you cannot trust Bamas. Um, after decades of war, a sense that Bamas have always been lying to us, cheating us, deceiving us. And whatever they do and say, we should not believe them. Um, including when President Dainsen suspended the dam, uh, many of my Kachin friends, colleagues believe that this is some sort of a trick, a deceit, it's not real. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi, NLD, Bama activists are simply using the Mission Dam issue for their own political agenda and so on. It is not for the love of Kachins. The fourth quote. This is by a Bama elder uh, who was involved in the Mission Antadam campaign. Don't be so narrow minded. Airavadi is not only for Kachin people, it's the national river of the whole Myanmar, north to south. Any separation between the Kachin campaign and the Yangon campaign comes from the history of war. Kachin see us Bama people as if Burma soldiers. But why is the war so long? Because it relates to business, like jade or the gold in Misam. War is created by both sides. And so this particular elder was quite upset uh, when, when, uh, when telling me this. Um, feeling uh, you know, a frustration with Kachin nationalism, with the ethnic politics and the desire to put the politics away. Um, and it's uh, quite a, so not everyone, but quite a few of the Bama campaigners expressed to me a sense that, uh, you know, war is, they want to be neutral, that the both sides are extreme and they want to kind of step away from, they want to focus on the river, the environment. And once we get into politics, we're just going to keep arguing and it's going to be a mess. So this also reflects a kind of Bama privilege uh, you could say that this that you can kind of step back and say that you know it's not of uh, not to do with us and, and we can be neutral, and and the frustration with the sense that the Kachins seem to be uh, pursuing national independence. And finally, the fifth quote is by a Kachin activist. When giving speeches to Bama audiences, I gave them an analogy. Kachins didn't have ancient kingdoms, so we don't have ruins. The natural environment, like Mison, is our heritage, like your ancient Bagan temples. So consider if somebody was trying to ruin Bagan just because there was a gold mine underneath. Would you let it happen? The Bamas were moved by this kind of message. So here you see a Kachin activist strategically trying to create empathy across ethnic lines and trying to ease some of those tensions and really seeking allies from among the Bamas both for the campaign against the Misandam, but also for broader Kachin political agendas. And, and these kind of actors were really key in creating these linkages between Kachins and Babas throughout the campaign. So what can we conclude? Uh, hydropolitics in Burma is so often uh, totally, totally interrelated with inter, uh, ethnopolitics, inter-ethnic relations. And often you really cannot disentangle them um, in the case of the Mison Dam campaign, um, I think we can conclude that these kind of inter-ethnic encounters that happened, they didn't unite Kachins and Bamas. At the end of the day, I would still say there were three separate campaigns, but the campaign kind of linked Kachins and Bamas in a rare and, and remarkable way. And there are lessons we can take from this history of campaigning against the Mison Dam for today's political crisis in Burma. Um, it, this story, this history shows that inter-ethnic resistance in Burma is possible, it can be very effective, and it is also difficult. Um, so if you would like to read more about this particular study, uh, so all the quotes come from this article, 
Confluence is a mid conflict journal of Burma studies. Um, and if you like to download it for free, here's a link. So thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you very much, Law, for this uh, very interesting um, uh, presentation. Um, I, I think like uh, the use of the curves are quite relevant in this case, and you kind of showcase from different uh, perspectives and views from Kachin, Bama, and also dif different ethnic perceptions relating to this common uh, uh, project, which is the, the Misong Dam. And I think uh, you have showcased the interconnectedness of this hydropolitics and also the ethnic politics, one creating these linkages of solving the common issues and also the frustrations that came alongside with it. Yes, so thank you very much for, for uh, your presentation, all the panelists. And then right now we have heard about the importance of the co-creations of the local knowledges, especially uh, example from the Inly Lake in Shan State, and also the relationship between the indigenous community and also their values to the land forests and also its ownerships and one transforming like the community government governance. Uh, we have heard about the Selwyn Peace Park and how it is important uh, in at this uh, important at this turbulent Myanmar politics um, in, in, at the moment. We also heard about the dam resistance in relationship to the state governance and also its historic binding to the local and development of the region alongside the resistance of uh, many of the uh, communities uh, towards, um, uh, towards the uh, uh, politics in Myanmar. So right now I would like to welcome Professor Scott uh, back to the floor after we have heard about this amazing work and also viewpoints and that we have learned the research outcomes uh, by our panelists, what, what is happening in Myanmar. So please give us some of your initial reflections and initial thoughts before we opening um, our floor to the audiences for more questions. Well, thank you. <clears throat> uh, mostly I just learned from these presentations. Uh, it was a kind of education on things I knew less about than I ought to know uh, in terms of Inya Lake, um, the Thanwin or Salween or Nu, depending on where you're looking at it. Um, uh, and also on the inter-ethnic collaboration um, uh, in opposition to the Mutsun, Mutsun Dam. Uh, <clears throat> I guess um, maybe I should first speak about the elephant in the room, uh, which is of course the coup and the Tatmadaw. Um, and it seems to me that everything about the future of, of Burma and its environment and uh, its ethnic groups and its concept of citizenship depends on the elimination of the Tatmadaw as the dictator of the country. Um, it seems to me that um, uh, should, if you like, the civilian uh, opposition now armed uh, fail, um, the question of the uh, predatory use of the Irrawaddy and of every other river in Burma uh, will be pursued um, 100% by the junta in an effort to fill its uh, treasury and uh, its personal profit. So in a sense, um, although the river doesn't speak, uh, 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 the river's future and the future of all of the life forms, not just Homo sapiens, but all the other life forms along the river uh, and their life or extinction uh, depend on the outcome of the struggle against the hunter. Um, the, uh, this is particular, a particular interest of mine, I suppose, um, that um, a, a bunch of very uh, talented French geographers, I think working with the FAO, produced a, um, a study of the hydrology of the uh, Aewani River uh, that's extremely detailed. And we, of course, have a lot of local groups up and down the Irrawaddy who've done uh, samples of the riverine ecology um, uh, and what is in danger and what is not in danger. In any case, at the end of their long study, which lasted a couple of years, uh, <clears throat> they actually held town meetings 
in um, all the way from uh, Bama, uh, Michina, or from Michina actually, uh, all the way down to the Delta and uh, asked people what their concerns were about the river. And as you might imagine, most of the concerns were um, essentially about pollution in the river, uh, about whether the water was drinkable, uh, in part about floods, um, uh, and some concern about the fish catch uh, in the river as well. What was, what was interesting, of course, is that this was, these were the concerns of Homo sapiens. Uh, and I had this fantasy that at the end of these town meetings, all of the river creatures would suddenly invade the town meeting and ask about their particular interests. You know, mostly our understanding, our appreciation for non-human life forms is pretty much confined to fish. And the reason it's confined to fish is because it's a major subsistence item uh, in the diet, right? Uh, and uh, it kind of matters in a direct way for Homo sapiens. But for the flora and fauna, and if you like, the non-commercial species, it seems to me that we, and, and I suppose in a sense, the Salween Peace Park is an effort to give voice, if you like, to the indigenous appreciation for the whole ecology, not just those that are, in the immediate short-term interest of Homo sapiens. Um, and so I guess um, there's an, a, a book about um, called uh, in American uh, environmental history called Should Trees Have Standing? And the, it's the question is, could you sue in the courts on behalf of natural objects like a forest or a tree, right? Uh, or a fish or you know, the salmon, right? Uh, in a way in which, because their interests need to be protected somehow. And of course, in the final analysis, it's homo sapiens who are going to do the protecting. Uh, they're the political actors. Um, and we need some way, and I'm not sure that's the appropriate way, but we need some way to create actors who are, um, the protectors of the whole ecology of the river and of the non-commercial species that are not of direct interest immediately to Homo sapiens, but on which the life ultimately of the whole river, I mean, there are what one might call keystone extinctions um, that change everything. Uh, and we know so little about which are the keystone species um, that we're absolutely more likely to stumble on an ecological disaster than we are to foresee it. And so we ought to pursue what's sometimes called the cautionary principle is that any intervention uh, ought to uh, be able to show that it is uh, unlikely to be dangerous for uh, the other species. So I guess I would ask all the panelists um, how, uh, I'm, I under, I'm very appreciative of the first, um, uh, the first talk on, on the democratization, if you like, of local voices in the river and the uh, attention to gender. Um, and I want the democratization to spread beyond homo sapiens and to embrace non-human species as well. And I'm unsure how this is done, but I am sure that it's important. Thank you very much for this extensive um, um, reflections and also linking it into the, um, the uh, sorry, uh, local voices and also the need of local voices in transforming this um, um, urgent uh, political situations. So I would like to um, ask the panelists to answer the uh, questions that the professor has just posted and please go ahead and then uh, unmute yourself and then start answering these questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I think I would like to uh, first start or call out uh, our uh, panelists uh, regarding into the local voices and the attention it needs to this transformative society and also the roles of this natural assets and also its ownership and its relationship to the uh, the politics uh, in the country. So I would like to start with Sergeant Bright, if you can uh, reflect on what the professor has just mentioned, uh, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Mabai. Um, and thank you, uh, Professor, for reflecting on, uh, on this discussion. Um, I think um, it is good that uh, you highlighted uh, the democratization of to non-human uh, non you know, uh, species. Like uh, in, the, in, in New Zealand, in New Zealand, uh, you know, people are also like talking about, uh, uh, you know, the, the rise of the river you know, uh, we recognize uh, in the in the in the law and policy. So I think that kind of thing can also happen in in the Southern River. You know, a uh, uh, river uh, have the right as a personhood. You know, so that we can um, uh, integrate. You know, this uh, democratization entity for the river as well, and and also. And also, it is very important. Uh, uh, like uh, when we talk about. Uh, institutionalization because uh, in in democratization institutionalization is very important uh, uh, but often uh, in in the previous uh, I mean administrations uh, when I look at the policies and and laws uh, uh, mostly I see you know uh, uh, a lot of uh, like uh, water policy for example in in the section of institution, uh, institutionalization section. I, I can only see Department of Water or Department of uh, Natural Resources or government. It, it's mostly government institution. I, I don't see any recognition on uh, uh, community institution, local institutions like we've been talking about, the community-based uh, resource governance, like Southern Peace Park and those things. I think this needs to be recognized in, 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 uh, in our future uh, democratization. When we talk about institution, it is not just government entities, but also uh, uh, entities that are mobilized by the people, like the Southern Peace Park and others that will come out uh, hopefully very soon. So um, I think that, uh, that, that two things uh, are, came, came up in, into my mind you know, when uh, I think about, you know, the reflections. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sergeant Wright. And I would like to also, I would like to hear uh, the initial reflections from other um, uh, panelists as well, uh, because I'm quite conscious of the time. So if you can give some one or two reflections before we closing the sessions, that would be very great. So now I think I will go to Jo Min Kim, uh, if that's all right. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it was also quite striking to see this anthropocentric uh, responses from the local communities when I was doing my field work in Myanmar, because they had the very little uh, concerns about the local environment when it comes to comes to the dams, actually. So they, I mean, one lady tell me in a, in a very straight face, she doesn't care about the environment, she, but she cares about the Kachin people. Uh, which was um, yeah, which which was striking, and and then and then I also learned uh, more about the gold mining upstream that uh, took place for about ten years. Maybe the environment was already too dis uh, destroyed uh, in their knowledge that it maybe possessed no 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 more value to to preserve. I mean, this is a very pessimistic point of view, but but then yesterday I, I attended a talk uh, that was. Uh, a, a meeting of uh, Mekong environmental experts, and and uh, it was it was very interesting because, as you know, in, in Myanmar, the environmental threats by the dams is still very hypothetical because not a, none of these big dams have been built, right? So we 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 need to understand the science, and th this needs to also translate it into the local like the language. I'm not talking about the Burmese language, but just to the context that the how local community can understand this impact on their daily life. 
But then in, in the Mekong, when there are now many dams been built upstream and they actually have the uh, unprecedented level of uh, water scarcity downstream. And, the, and the, one of this Vietnamese uh, expert was very outspoken that the mangrove forest and the coastal erosions are caused by dams. That was just the striking uh, remarks. And I think, I think we will probably see some of these iterations by the local communities uh, in, in Myanmar if uh, some of these environmental destructions uh, worsen uh, also by the man-made undertakings, but as well as the climate change and so on. So I think it's, I think, I think we may see the change uh, in the future because of the mounting uh, challenges and environmental uh, destruction. Well, I hope that doesn't come, but I, yeah, I'll, I'll like to end here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, remark and also reflections. Now I would like to uh, invite uh, Law uh, again uh, to re reflect uh, your uh, initial thoughts uh, on what things have uh, said and discussed so far. Thanks. So <clears throat> I would like to make a rather obvious point that when we talk of the democratization uh, encompassing non-humans, then of course it'll obviously still be humans who will kind of decide what are the objects in nature, what are the actual categories of things that exist, what is a river, what is a lake, what is a mountain. And um, uh, in the Misa Dam case, uh, one of the striking things that came out is that for many Kachin activists, the question was about the place of Misa on confluence, a heartland, a cultural heartland where uh, according to Kachin, uh, kind of tradition our ancestors traveled through into the places they live now above Misan. And for Bamas and lowland Burmese, of course, the question was much more about the river, the last today was also mentioned, the lifeblood of, of Bama people and Burma. Um, so even though it seems as if people are fighting for the same thing and against the same thing, actually they are, uh, they have really different emphasis. So Kachins had to kind of save the Misan campaign and Bamas had saved the Airawadi campaign. Um, Yet uh, that uh, doesn't have to be um, a, a point for pessimism. Uh, kind of discussing and learning about each other's concerns about the natural world can also be a place of learning about each other's nationalisms, concerns, politics, views, uh, visions for the future. Um, so one story that I didn't tell today, but is in my article, is about this Bama environmental scientists who went up to Misan, to Kachinland, uh, to do the environmental impact assessment. They were paid by the Chinese company, but they were very much Burmese nationalist people, and they were very much trying to find evidence uh, about uh, ecological value in this region. And inevitably, when they spent weeks there doing field work, they hung out with a lot of Kachin villages, they met a lot of people, they realized how much Kachin people resented them as Bamas, and they learned a lot. And uh, very strikingly, in their environmental impact assessment, which was later leaked to the internet, and people, many of us have read it, and it was influential in uh, kind of convincing President Deng Tsai to suspend them, they have these amazing sentences about how Kachin cultural values surpass any extra money costs to uh, cancel this dam and push it upstream and build two smaller dams instead. And it was very striking to read Bama scientists, really generally anti-apolitical people to make this kind of very ethno-political statements in favor of Kachins. So talking about this, the what is valuable in nature, the river or the Misong cultural heartland, whatnot can be a place of, again, a kind of inter-ethnic learning. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, reflections and also the very important uh, roles uh, of the um, uh, ethnic politics in the hydropolitics as well in Myanmar. Now, last but not least, I would like to also hear the reflection from Matt Nawan Lee. Um, if, yeah, uh, regarding uh, the discussion before we close the panel. Yes, <laughs> thank you. We can also close the video if um, um, I'm aware okay. that the connections in Myanmar is not uh, very stable at the moment. If I say to Thailand already, but still, <laughs> the connection is still not good. <laughs> I just arrived in <laughs> Thailand. Yeah, okay, yeah. Based on the local people really put value on the 
water, especially in the lake, because they really worry. worry. They, they also change, they, they, they have uh, witnessed that the changes were um, too much compared to the last 15 years. So now they, um, um, the local people, they really want to conserve and they, they want to keep the uh, in the lake to be clean and to be healthy as before. Now they really concerned because a lot of environmental changes, climate change, as well as the uh, the water level and pollution of um, of the lake. So now um, a lot of uh, project came in, especially UN project. They just came with their own idea, and one year after one or two years and already gone and not really sustained. So now they're really concerned about, they want to do by themselves. They know their own problem and they know how to solve it. But the problem is the, the policy maker not really support their idea. So I think because of the group data, so I, we cannot do anything for now, but in the near future, I think if the local people, they really have their own, uh, their own recommendation, their own idea of how to solve the problem. So in the future, we hope that it's going to be worked out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, bringing in the uh, thoughts from the Inly Lake and also the local issues that is happening there and its relationship to the current policy and also the, how it can help in the political uh, policy making as well. So now I would like to bring back Stu uh, to uh, reflect on the uh, conversation as well as uh, to close the panel for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pani. Um, uh, thank you for all of that. I, I hope um, the audience who stuck with us uh, appreciated that uh, half as much as I did. Uh, that was fascinating. And I really enjoyed uh, uh, even working on putting this together. I didn't really see some of the, the connections and, and overlaps and themes until you, you were all speaking. There's, there's a lot there. Um, I guess as, as we close, I do want to acknowledge a, a couple things um, to finish up. Um, it's um, April 21st, uh, and this is a, a great time to be hosting an event on Myanmar. This is an anniversary of the Blue Shirt Campaign, um, bringing awareness to the over 3,000 uh, illicitly detained political prisoners in Myanmar. So I encourage uh, everyone to, to uh, look up a, a bit about that uh, campaign and Uwin Tin. And I also uh, would like to invite Professor Scott to speak uh, and maybe give an introduction uh, uh, give some sort of background on, on Mutual Aid Myanmar and some of the uh, work you've been doing in Myanmar uh, outside of academia. Just very briefly, <coughs> I, we set up Mutual Aid Myanmar with um, Tun Mint, uh, who's a professor at Carleton in the United States, um, and um, Ajahn Chayan at Chiang Mai University, who many of you know, um, and the effort originally, and um, we raised nearly a million dollars, which was dedicated to the, um, uh, the subsistence help uh, to striking uh, public sector workers, doctors, teachers, uh, nurses, and so on, who refused to work uh, with the junta. And <clears throat> that money, has been kind of delivered, if you like, on the street very carefully through trusted intermediaries. And we're grateful to the extraordinary response that we had. We also were able to raise money um, uh, uh, from the actually uh, Open Society Foundation, uh, another half million dollars that was devoted to Burmese intellectuals who fled to Thailand to Mesot and uh, Chiang Mai uh, and who could be incorporated in the programs of Chiang Mai University thanks to the good work of Ajahn uh, Chayan. So I understand that there are lots of other uh, aid groups uh, helping the resistance in Burma um, and this is not the only one but if you uh, are inclined to make a contribution Mutual Aid Myanmar, uh, one word uh, dot org uh, is the way to make a connection uh, with that uh, website and uh, donation location. Uh, so 
uh, thank you. I think we all um, somehow, as I said, a lot of the future of Burmese rivers and the Burmese environment depends on the outcome of this existential struggle. Yeah, thank you. And I think we will leave it there. Um, uh, there's a link for mutual aid Myanmar in the chat. Um, there's also more information on, on the website about this event and some of these scholars who you've heard present today where you can find more information about their organizations uh, and, and their work. Um, if there are also other burning questions, I'm sorry we squeezed the Q&A a little bit. There is also a comment section um, on the event page on the website and we will follow up and can try to keep this conversation going. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, quite difficult to keep some attention on, on Myanmar with the sort of uh, the amount of information and news that's flowing around. Um, but uh, we really encourage people to, to stay engaged with this. This is, not, uh, this is not going away. And as Professor Scott uh, mentioned, um, uh, all life forms uh, in, in the country uh, depend on the outcome of this struggle. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Thank you so much for the presenters. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, have a good day.